I can see the sign. So good evening to all and welcome to tonight's talk, <clears throat> which promises to be a very interesting one because of the subject is so interesting and deserves uh, better and best attention. But first, as it is customary, on behalf of the Dante Alighieri Society, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigai people of the Ora Nation, the custodian of the land, <clears throat> Excuse me, and recognize their continuing uh, connection to the land, the water, and the culture. We pay our respect to the elders, past, present, and uh, emerging. Tonight's subject is the art of a woman that, against all odds, became famous in the first years of the first half of the 1600s as a painter of great ability, a follower of the school of Caravaggio. The, the light, the impressions, and so on. She was born in Rome, and then uh, she left Rome, traveled to Florence, to work in London, and returned to Italy later to move to Naples, where she eventually died in 1653 at the age of 60 years. But could be 1652, 1652 as a, the date is not all that set. Artemisa Gestileschi had a very difficult life. They followed the rape by her custodians, the friends of her father, who eventually did the wrong thing. And uh, not only for that, but also because of the social standard of the, of the time when a, a woman could not attain uh, proper schooling and recognition outside the limit of that society. However, since she worked in her father's workshop, uh, who was a painter of modest uh, ability and fame, at the end of 15, she produced her first solo work, if you want to call it this way, followed in two years, at 17 years of age, by a, a fantastic painting, which is called Susanna and the Elders, which is a, a mythical um, uh, story. Uh, I believe this is a fantastic work. You will see uh, when uh, Karen will show it to us. Um, the subject of Suzanne and the Elders is something that returned very often later in uh, during her life as a, um, as a subject that obviously interests her very much. Uh, a, rec a recognition of uh, as, as a painter uh, has in recent time been somewhat obscured by the current feminist movement because her work has aspect that suggests a form of revenge for what she was subjected to during her life. To add insult to injury, so to speak, it's, it's after her death, uh, paintings were uh, conveniently attributed to her father, since it was considered that uh, it would have been impossible for a young woman in, to or to achieve such fame and such ability. So the things were corrected. Now, I better can be careful about my enthusiasm for Artemisa Gentileschi. Associate Professor Dr. McLuske is an art historian with a particular research focus on the intersection of art and lived, research, research, sorry, for art and lived religious experience in the later Middle Ages, especially in Italy. Author of some very important monographs, Karen is currently, currently working on uh, representations of disability and impairment in the pictorial hagiography of Beata Fina de Ricciardi, the 15th century son in 15th century San Gimignano in Tuscany. Fina de Ricciardi was a young girl affected by a terrible disease that forced her to lay on a board for all her life. She still, however, very much loved in San Gimignano because apparently she performed some rather mysterious University from the University of Sydney in 2006 has been teaching history and art history at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, 
since the inception, its inception in 2006. So with many thanks to you all, and now let Karen open your eyes to an artist, a woman of extraordinary talent and personality. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much, Fabio, for that very kind introduction. And um, obviously your interest in Artemisia um, is, is very strong. So I'm very pleased to be here and I'm very um, excited to introduce you to Artemisia. Again, I hope that my connection is working out okay and that we're not going to have too much trouble. Uh, so tonight the talk will be on um, this amazing woman, Artemisia Gentileschi, as, as Fabio has, has mentioned, whose artwork, her, her entire oeuvre, um, exemplifies um, some of the most accomplished and representative artworks of the Italian Baroque. Her work also captures something of the experience of living as an artist, as a woman, a daughter, and a wife in, in the period. So much has been said about Artemisia, especially you know, in the last half century or so since gender history has begun to achieve a, a kind of relative equality in relation to standard histories. But there's still so much to understand about Artemisia. As Fabio mentioned, there have been a lot of inferences in, in scholarship about what she painted and why she chose particular subjects to paint and what they all have to do with her traumatic rape and the disturbing trial that followed at which she, the victim, had to prove that she was telling the truth under torture. Um, she was only 18 years old. So to the extent that it's possible, uh, tonight I'm going to try to put her art, not her life, at the center of the talk. My aim is to see what it can tell us or not tell us about the woman herself. So for this reason, I will only address a handful of her extant works, um, although deeply and analytically to see what I can tease out. I will also use some comparative material to situate her uh, work in its artistic context. So I'm going to be a little bit unorthodox. I'm going to begin the discussion of Artemisia in the middle of her career. Um, and I'm going to let her introduce herself to you. After all, um, this extraordinary self-portrait, which you can see on the slide um, from 1638 to 39, captures essentially how she wanted to be seen by her world and how she wished to be remembered. And so I think it's fair that we let her speak for herself, um, a novel opportunity in her era to be sure. The self-portrait as allegory of painting um, shows a confident and innovative painter. And we know this immediately upon engaging um, with the subject matter of the painting. Here, in a totally unprecedented way, Artemisia combines two common genres, the self-portrait and the allegory of painting motif. But she does this in powerfully unique and sophisticated ways, which I'll talk about in a few minutes at quite some length. <laughs> and the composition um, is obviously innovative as well, just by looking at it. You can see especially the use of the diagonal that across the plane, especially with her arm and the foreshortening, which creates a dynamic and uh, quite energetic image. It's quite unusual um, for self-portraits. The perspective that she uses of looking down upon herself as she twists to look at something or someone or to reach out to a part of the canvas that, she, that her brush needs to touch um, shows the vitality of the subject and Artemisia's creative energy. So through these compositional, the, the compositional device of the trompe l'oeil, she forces the viewer's eye in particular ways so that she can tell her own story. So basically that means she draws the viewer in from the palette, um, up the arm, and then towards the breast. So there's, the breast is centrally located and it has the lightest hue, so we're automatically drawn there but it's the arm that brings us to that point. The um, lighted breast, if you will, um, is a symbol of femininity of the subject. 
and also the truth of the image. So she was, especially after that terrible um, experience of having to prove herself in court, truth was very important to her. The necklace with the mask hanging, you see down at the bottom there, um, announces the subject as an allegory. It symbolizes, the mask does, artistic artifice. The chain forces the eye up towards the head, um, encouraged by the light hues of the forehead. So all of this is her way of telling us what we're meant to be looking at. The figure itself is deliberately not engaged with the viewer, yet she is fully engaging. Um, she uses a, a typical Baroque compositional device which is the viewer's curiosity is taken outside of the frame through gesture or glance. So we ask the question just by looking at what is she looking at or what is she painting? So there's a curiosity that's excited in the viewer by the way she paints um, this sort of gaze, this outside force that's acting upon the subject. So the gaze, her gaze leads us across the um, canvas to the hand and to the paintbrush. Um, the brush and the gaze are in cahoots, drawing our eye to something outside of the painting. The technique as well is rich and alive. It's accomplished through refined, refined brushwork. Um, it's quick and energetic in its strokes. And she has this wonderful ability to capture luxuriant textures. Uh, my favorite part of this panel is her, the damp skin on her forehead. So you can almost see the shininess of of the sweat on her brow. Um, but she also, as you can see in the, uh, the sleeve of her, her dress, um, creates this amazingly accurate shiny satin effect. And that contrasts with the delicate lace around her bodice and even in the sleeves, the shimmering gold of the chain, for instance, and then the wisps of hair which hang down from her head. All of these devices are specifically chosen by Artemisia to tell us something about her. But before we get to her message, let's just have a look, first of all, at some of the artistic conventions relating to the two genres, the portraiture genre and the pictura or um, the allegory of painting motif. Okay, so she combines both of them in the panel, but let's just sort of separate them out a little bit. So I'm going to look at, oops, um, two very accomplished portrait painters in the period. And um, so we've got John Lorenzo Bernini on, on the left and Peter Paul Rubens on the right, just as a sort of marker of what the conventions were at the time. The self-portrait itself was a very common genre, especially since the Renaissance, um, as the status of the artist rose. Self-portraits are typically identifiable quite easily from their features, especially as you can see with these two portraits, that penetrating gaze, the, the way the eyeball like, literally looks out of the panel um, at the, it's seemingly the viewer, but in fact, there's that artifice again because it's, they're actually looking at themselves. Um, so there's that penetrating gaze, um, the turn of the head, the three-quarter pose, and often uh, the self-portraits are bust length. Artists' um, self-portraits serve many functions in the history of art. Um, a few of them are to characterize and memorialize the individual, so just like any portrait, to show the elevated status of the sitter, also like regular portraits, but also to advertise the skill of the painter. So in these two portraits, I'll explain those a little bit more. Uh, both Bernini and Rubens have that really penetrating gaze. It's self-assured, it's a very confident gaze. Added to that, they both have this kind of vitality, this energy, which is imbued in their subject by the parted lips. Look about to speak, about to say something to you. So this vitality in the red cheeks, both of them have this kind of flush, um, the parted lips, the turn all create a sense that this is a real living person. The creativity of the artist is symbolized by the lighted forehead. So again, both um, have this, this um, cast of light upon their, their heads, which symbolizes um, creativity and intelligence. 
The artists often presented themselves as gentlemen to show their wealth and, and their status. And this is signaled through their choice of costume. There's another reason though for dressing up in costume as it were, and that is to demonstrate the artist's skill. So how well the artist can paint fabrics and textures, likenesses, all of this was meant to appeal to potential patrons. So if you notice in these two portraits on the screen, there's no sign of the painter's tools. So these artists are actually showing that they are above them, so to speak. They're not mere craftsmen, but gentlemen. And this is especially evident with Rubens. Female self-portraits um, were quite different. Two of the most famous female painters of the period, Italian painters of the period, Lavinia Fontana and Sofonisba Anguissola. Um, both of them painted themselves according to the discourses of femininity current at the time. Uh, Sofonisba first in 1556 painted um, the image you see on the right, um, clearly in terms of the gendered expectations of her period. So she paints herself as the ultimate chaste woman, dressed modestly. So she, the color of her garments are subtle. Um, there's little of her body revealed in the images. Her hair is pulled back appropriately, yet she is not without nobility. So the lace ruff and the cuffs on her undergarment, the quality of the fabric she dresses herself in, all of these speak to her wealth and nobility. She paints the Virgin Mary and the Christ child, which is the most noble of subjects at the time to paint and quite appropriate for a woman. And by doing so, she also shows her piety. Like Rubens and Bernini to an extent, but definitely that Rubens, she is showing off her skill. Um, unlike Rubens, however, she has put her commitment to the painter's craft at center stage. So note how half of this painting is actually taken up by the painter's craft, by the trade. And this demonstrates really that women were fighting to be recognized as legitimate artists. They were putting those tools up front. Lavinia Fontana's uh, uh, portrait is a marriage portrait, and it was made for her future father-in-law, Severo Zappi. So she was of a lower social order than her family, and so she shows herself here amidst wealth in her lavish clothing, um, the jewels that she wears, there's a servant behind her, all of these symbolize her wealth. She also advertises her talents, so music by playing the um, virginal, but also if you notice in the background, there's a reference to her, her artistic capabilities. There's a Latin inscription up the top of the panel, which you can see here, and it signals her high intellect and learning, the very fact that it's written in Latin suggests um, that she's a very educated young woman. But it also adds some more attributes to Lavinia's um, portrait, which is that she identifies herself as a virgin. She's, she identifies herself also as the daughter of Prospero Fontana, an artist, and she declares the truthfulness of the portrait in that inscription. So both these images are carefully controlled presentations of the self according to the conventions of the time. Artemisia's is also carefully controlled, but she doesn't so readily follow the expected norms. Her self-portraits were, oops, sorry about that. Her self-portraits were actually rather sought after in the period, uh, especially because of her unique status as a woman artist, a controversial figure, and as a master painter. So let's look at the second genre type that Ar Artemisia taps into for her work. And that's the allegory of painting, la pictura. The genre was established as artists urged by Leon Battista Alberti's 15th century treatise on the science of, of art sought to position their discipline firmly within the liberal arts and thereby increase its status and ultimately theirs. So here we note Artemisia's ingenuity. Many male painters depicted pictura, the allegory of painting, in stock standard modes. And you can see that particularly here in Simone Cantarini's allegory of painting from the 1620s. He paints a beautiful dark haired female, brushes in hand, 
arched eyebrows suggesting imagination. Poised and she, she's poised and she turns towards the viewer, but she doesn't engage directly. The light of intellectual enlightenment, of course, is, is hitting her forehead um, as she paints a, a subject appropriate to a female, a mythological figure, probably, I'm guessing, because of the Cupid figure who peeks around the uh, canvas, that the um, subject is uh, probably Venus, the goddess of love. Um, she represents passionate desire and also energy. So Cantarini captures many of the characteristics of the allegory of painting motif codified, codified sorry, by Cesare Ripa in his Iconologia in 1624. So thereafter, the type was studiously followed by innumerable artists, including Artemisia. But Artemisia does something different. She takes advantage of her almost unique position as a female artist to bring the allegory and the self-portrait together. Here, following Ripa, she expresses the dynamism uh, and energy exemplary of the type through that unique composition that I mentioned before and the soft brushwork. She articulates Pictura's creativity, imagination and intellectualism through the light hues that hit her breast and her forehead. She deliberately acknowledges the craft of painting through the very clearly positioned palette and brush in her hand. In this, she's self-referential. Rather than an objective subject, the Virgin Mary or, or a goddess, she is painting herself, painting the allegory of painting. <laughs> so it's a circular trick in a kind of way. Where does the illusion end? and reality begin. And so this is the ultimate artistic trick symbolized by the mask dangling from her necklace, representing the artist's specialty in deceit. In the artist's hand, the allegorical figure, Pictura, is seamlessly embodied in Artemisia herself. Indeed, this is how she wanted to be remembered as the physical embodiment of painting. The energy and purpose of her work shows herself as an unabashedly unidealized woman, engaged in active labor with dirty hands of average beauty, notice her straight eyebrows, um, her unkempt hair, her bodily proportions are heavy set. She holds her 40 something years in full light in this image. She also paints herself in average means. So she's not wealthy, she's not noble, she's not depicting herself as such. In fact, she has an apron here um, placed over top of a dress. There's no artifice here. It is real and a true woman that is being represented. She's not looking to represent herself as an ideal or, as, or in an elevated social position like Rubens and Fontana did. She is hardworking, determined, focused, and skillful. What it seems is that Artemisia is at once reflecting on her place in the world where gendered expectations, as, as Fabio was mentioning earlier, made it quite difficult, almost impossible for a woman to be a successful painter, to be actively engaged in a craft, to be respected by peers and patrons. Here in this painting, Artemisia is not apologizing for her exceptional presence in a largely male sphere, She's demanding respect for her accomplishments as an artist. And she's very self-conscious of her skill, of where she stands in relation to her peers. And clearly she sees herself as superior, okay? um, And yet she's fully aware of how women are regarded by her contemporaries. So we know this because in this manifesto, she boldly announces her place, not as an imposter, but as the very epitome of painting. So let's give her the respect she deserves and evaluate her work on the terms she has set. So on that, we can evaluate for ourselves whether or not she deserves our praise. So the first thing I want to think about is how, how she got to this point of confidence, of mastery, of ingenuity that we see in the 13th, uh, sorry, 1638 painting. And so I want to look at the world of Artemisia first and foremost. The earliest dated work associated with Artemisia, again, as Fabio mentioned before, is this Susanna and the Elders. 
and it's a testament to her early genius. She was 17 years old when she painted the image. The painting shows extraordinary skill in handling form and texture and composition. It represents an Old Testament story from the book of Daniel in which two elders spy on the virtuous woman, Susanna, as she bathes. With false accusations of adultery, the voyeurs try to blackmail her into having sex with them. She refuses, despite facing death for her apparent crime. It was a common moralizing story meant to remind the viewer, both male and female alike, to remain virtuous and to not turn away from God. Unlike typical versions of the story, which show Susanna either totally unaware of their gazes or flirtatiously accepting them, Artemisia's image packs a powerful psychological punch. We have here Susanna's body sensitively rendered according to the classical conventions of the time. It's proportionate, it's taut, and it's dynamic, especially with that lovely twist that Artemisia places upon it. Not only does the figure turn away from the man, her face is contorted in despair and flushed red from fear or perhaps humiliation or both. But compositionally, Artemisia paints the conspiring men much bigger than Susanna, effectively imposing them upon her. Their heavy cloaks, especially the bright and fullness of the red one, ensure their compositional prominence. The suffocating scene is enhanced by the wall, which push, pushes Susanna onto the frontal plane, firmly into the viewer's space. She effectively has nowhere to go. So this psychological tension becomes almost raw or stifling. So even at this early age, we see Artemisia's genius at work. So if we compare to other contemporary visions, versions sorry, of, the, of the same scene, uh, we start to understand her exceptionality. So the one on the, the bottom right is Lorenzo Lotto um, from a little bit earlier, 100 years earlier, 1517, um, and Tintoretto's 1560, um, innocuously titled Susanna at her bath. We know what's going on. It just hasn't been acknowledged in the title. Um, so the classicism of Lorenzo Lotto's diffuses the sort of predatory nature of the old men. It's almost a, yes, she's got her arm up, but it's almost this, she's on a, almost a plinth this, in this kind of um, theatrical space. The um, Tintoretto's evades the issue almost entirely. The two men are pushed almost out of view. You can see them at the top back of the, the canvas there. And Susanna looks out at the viewer, not unhappily, as though we are the unexpected, even accepted intruder. Here in Tintoretto's version, the, the full female form is on view for the viewer, and it places us in, in a rather uncomfortable position, which I suppose is the point. Um, we become the voyeur. Another image um, is Guercino's Susanna and the Elders of 1617. And it's a little bit more successful in making the audience complicit by projecting the hand of the elder here um, into the viewer's space. That's that trompe l'oeil technique where you're, you're driven in, your eye is brought into the canvas by something inside the canvas. The other figure up here, instead of telling Susanna to shush, is telling us to be quiet. So you see how it's directly engaging um, with the viewer. In terms of Susanna, her white body and the sensuous lines of, of her uh, almost nude figure draw, draw our immediate attention. Indeed, in the hands of not all, but certainly most male painters, the narrative of Susanna and the elders offered a platform for visualizing the desired female body. That is, it offered manifold opportunities for sexualizing and resubjugating women in the guise of virtu a virtu virtuous um, moralizing message. Comparatively, Artemisia's version is more powerful, more visceral, and perhaps, as some scholars have argued, witness to a young woman already a year before her documented rape, being and besieged by the unwanted advances of her male peers. 
At this time, the first decade of the 17th century, Artemisia worked in her father's studio alongside other artists and apprentices. Her father, Orazio, was very protective of his daughter. This was not in, unusual in the period, of course. He, like most fathers, just whatever care or concern he might have had for his daughter, also aimed to um, protect the family, uh, the family honor by ensuring his daughter's virtue. Artemisia's mother died in 1605 when Artemisia was 12. From then, she had to take care of her younger siblings. Yet at the same time, her father encouraged her as an artist. He acknowledged her great skill, even over that of, of his sons, and he taught her his craft. And then he hired another artist, Agostino Tassi, to instruct her. And it was during his tutelage in 1611 that he raped her. So this is a very significant moment in Artemisia's life, there is no doubt. Relations with Tassi appear to have been unwanted, first of all, and yet under the laws of the time, if she nevertheless submitted to him, that is, married him, she could retain her honor, and so could the family. The woman's value in the period was always seen in relation to the patriarchy, the home, and the male. When Tassi, long story short, also ultimately refused to marry Artemisia, Orazio pressed charges. Tassi effectively devalued Orazio's family by taking Artemisia's virginity and for not following through with the marriage. In the seven month trial that ensued, Artemisia had to not only undergo clinical examinations, publicly reveal everything that happened during the rape and ensuing period, but to ensure that she was telling the truth, she had to undergo a thumbscrew torture with the very real prospect of disabling her hands. Ultimately, again, long story short, her testimony was validated. Tassi was exiled, although because of his very strong political connections, his punishment was never carried out. Artemisia's father quickly married her to Pierantonio Staitesi, a minor Florentine artist, uh, and they moved to Florence where they had five children, three of whom died in the ensuing eight years. During that time, Artemisia became romantically involved with a wealthy Florentine nobleman who both supported her family financially and who introduced her to important patrons and supporters in Florence. She and Pierantonio eventually moved back to Rome and ultimately separated. She never remarried, but moved around Italy in search of commissions, settling at times in Naples and Venice, and she even had a foray in England, which is where the um, first portrait I showed was most likely painted. All the while, she was being influenced by and influencing the art scene. She was respected at various courts, and was the first woman to enter the Academy of Art and Design in Florence. So her life was always a struggle against an unforgiving patriarchy, an experience which is quite visible in her works. But now let's shift again back to the focus, which is what happens to Artemisia artistically between that um, eventful rape in 1611 and her death in 1653. Well, obviously it's too much to deliver here in, a, in a, such a short time, but I'll pick out a few key um, ideas and a few key works that maybe will help us to um, discern something about um, Artemisia. When I was asked to do the presentation, I thought, well, I'll have a quick look at a large sampling of of her many extant paintings. There are lots of lists on the internet that none of them ever complete. Um, but I can make a few observations, um, which maybe can be refined at a further time. But by large, her focus um, in terms of subject was on Old Testament scenes or figures. And many of the subjects were women who were objectified, raped, or otherwise oppressed by men. Susanna, whom we've already spoken about, is a very good example. Many of her Old Testament figures take charge against the male patriarchy. 
Judith, whom we'll talk about a lot today, um, is one of those. But Esther and Bathsheba also appear in, um, in Artemisia's painting, paintings. Another type that's common in her work are martyrs and early Christian saints. And she has a particular focus, I'll just switch the slide, on um, the Mary Magdalene. Okay, and here we see um, a, an image of her as melancholia. And some, again, some scholars have suggested that it might reflect Artemisia's psychological state, perhaps after the rape, or just more generally. Um, we're not quite sure. Again, we, we, there's certain things we cannot de determine from the paintings. Okay? Um, often the images of Mary Magdalene will be of the penitent Magdalene. So is there a sense of guilt perhaps associated with um, how, she, how, how Artemisia herself acted out her life? Who knows? That is some of the suggestion from scholarship. Saint Cecilia appears a little bit in her images. Um, she maintained virginity in marriage, or so the story goes. Um, Catherine of Alexandria appears, um, who underwent um, torture. Um, a number of mythological scenes and historical scenes also are depicted. Um, there's uh, Venus figures, uh, images of Cleopatra, the Egyptian queen, um, Luke. Tricia, um, but in all of these, it seems that Artemisia brings the plight of women to light. Um, some virgin and child paintings um, appear, traditional Christian narratives and other saints' images, but not as many as one might expect for a woman. And I found that quite interesting. Um, here's a Annunciation, um, which I'll refer to in a few minutes, that um, she painted in 1630s during her Neapolitan period. Uh, lots of self-portraits, or again, that's up to um, scholarship to decide, I suppose. Some say it's just a, a figural type that she liked, but it happened to look a little bit like her. Or others argue that she used um, herself as a model often, and so the figures took on a likeness to her. So whether or not these are self-portraits or not um, is up to consideration, but certainly the first one I showed you was definitely a, a self-portrait. She acknowledges it as that. And in her writing, she often speaks about um, self-portraits that she's done. She's done a few other portraits. I think this one, um, of the Gonfalonieri, is, is quite um, exceptional. He's got a lot of character with his little swagger and his, um, the quality of his, um, the armor that she paints is just so representative of her accomplishments. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at the types of images she painted because, uh, especially considering the events of her life, which I've summarily described, what the sum total of her work shows us is that she was unusually focused on female protagonists and whether or not that's because of her life events or not, we can't 100% say. Although a lot of men painted such subjects too, um, what sets her apart from the male peers is her propensity to turn these subjects into heroic figures. So she essentially invents a new figure type, the strong female hero. So aside from subject matter, what else? characterizes Artemisia's work. The predominant artistic influence in the early years of her life is her father, Orazio, but more importantly is Caravaggio. Caravaggio's style becomes a determining factor in her work. Indeed, the development of his dramatic style was her main tool in bringing the drama and emotion of the female protagonist uh, to life. So now I just want to focus on the artistic world of Artemisia. So stylistic influences are to hand. In fact, Caravaggio was apparently a friend of Orazio. So um, they certainly um, worked in the same circles and um, Orazio was very much influenced by him as well. But our, the artistic world of Artemisia was determined also by the Counter-Reformation Italy more broadly and the style which we now call the Baroque. The main patron of Baroque artworks was the papacy and 
the greatest aim was, or almost singular aim, was to reaffirm Rome's place in response to the dissolution of religious primacy in Europe, the Reformation. Okay? So a lot of the artworks of, uh, of uh, Reformation, or Reformation Rome were characterized by magnificence. So big works full of theatricality, drama, texture, enduring materials. So a lot of wealth and a lot of endurance built into the images. The religious artworks were distinguished by affective energy and visionary motifs, which were all meant to appeal to the emotions of the viewer and reaffirm the spirituality that was called into question by Protestantism. The artwork often included um, an unknown force outside the frame. We've already spoken about that in relation to Artemisia's portrait. And that works to enhance the drama, the affect, and the participation of the audience by extending into the viewer's space. Artemisia's Rome was the fountainhead of this artistic renewal. And so there's a lot of artistic activity going on there, a lot of innovation and patronage, which she would have been um, you would have experienced, it would have been um, a part of her world. Although the lead was taken by the papacy in terms of patronage, this new approach filtered through Rome and beyond and it fundamentally characterized the period. A very good example is uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini's Ecstasy of San Teresa from 1645 to 52. What he represents here is a visionary experience a scene from the life of Teresa of Avila, a Spanish Reformation saint. In her writing, she tells us that while in a state of deep contemplation, an angel appeared to her and pierced her heart with a flaming golden arrow. Of her experience, she writes this. The pain was so great that I screamed aloud, but at the same time, I felt such infinite sweetness that I wished the pain to last forever. It was not physical, but psychic pain although it affected the body as well to some degree. It was the sweetest caressing of the soul by God. And it is that last line that Bernini captures in this image. He renders the image in very sensual terms. The saint's ecstasy is palpable. He includes very dramatic, um, heavy marble. You can see the textures and the colors and the, the decorative elements in the, the ensemble. He creates this illusion, again, that artist's artifice of having this massive piece of marble float as though it's on clouds. <laughs> so it's just amazing. Um, Teresa's uh, drapery billows below the clouds. The entire scene is lit from a window high above. So there's an oculus up above. Um, and it sort of comes down those golden shafts and creates a, an otherworldly light. So this is again meant to enhance the drama and the, the visionary experience for, for the spectator. The light is the invisible complement, the exterior force. But non-Roman artists also came to work in Rome. And this is where Michelangelo da Caravaggio comes in. So he's from a city, uh, Caravaggio, near Milan. Caravaggio gained commissions from important Roman families, but his art, although encapsulating the, the Baroque spirit in many ways, his appeal to the emotions, his return to nature, the classical forms of his work, he was a lot less showy and grandiose, for instance, than Bernini. Like many of the other artists of his time, he professed the superiority of direct observation of nature and drew upon actual models. The models he used, in fact, were people of lower class of Roman society, of the real Rome, as he saw it. And so often in his images, you'll find a, a tension between the heightened subject matter, usually biblical or gospel stories, and lowly models. Stylistically, Caravaggio stands apart from his peers. He, he uses an extreme chiaroscuro, that is the the use of, of shadow and light to create form, uh, a technique that was formalized um, by Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century. With Caravaggio, chiaroscuro takes on a life of its own. 
1599, he was um, given this, com uh, this commission um, by the uh, Contarelli family in Rome at um, San Luigi de Francesi, three scenes from the life of St. Matthew. This is one of his most important commissions and most famous, and this is one that Artemisia surely would have seen. It's called The Calling of St. Matthew, this one in particular. And what's interesting about the subject is we've never ever seen a religious subject depicted in such crude terms. And what I mean by that is by including contemporary so-called low life. So Matthew, who's the tax collector, is painted here in, the, in this middle. He sits together with some armed men, some armed dandies with their plumes and their hats and their hats in what appears to be a common Roman tavern. Approach from the right. They are poor. You can see that they have bare feet and simple garments and contrast markedly with the colorful costumes of Matthew and his group. A dialogue ensues in the painting conveyed through gesture. So Matthew, hand highlighted, points at himself as though questioning you know, what the conversation is about and are you really speaking to me? Uh, one of the new arrivals points a limp finger directly at him. The only supernatural feature in the panel is the discrete halo. You can just see it here above the head of the pointing figure who is obviously Christ. The hand gesture is the major focus of the scene and it's highlighted against the severe dark background and emphasized by the middle pane of the window, the way it pops down um, and the shaft of light goes across. So it's very much the centerpiece of the work. The strong beam of sunlight above Christ's head illuminates his face amidst this gloomy interior. And this shaft of light is very much a hallmark of Caravaggio's style, and we'll see it prop up again in Artemisia's work as well. Although a wholly reasonable naturalistic effect, the shaft of light is symbolically charged. The beam carries Christ's message across to Matthew. It identifies Christ as the light of the world. It makes really the divine presence known. And it highlights the role of the apostles as illuminators of faith. Another highlight of a hallmark of Caravaggio's style is the compressed space in which these figures um, act. And it you can see that the wall really shoves their, their bodies into the frontal plane, just like we saw with uh, Artemisia's uh, painting of Susanna, that wall that shoves the, the subject into the viewer's space um, and onto the frontal plane. Um, so that creates, again, a kind of immediacy within the painting um, that people could identify with. So if we're talking about counter-Reformation Rome and we want a connection to the subject matter, Caravaggio really pushes this into your face and tries to make a, an affective connection between the reality of Roman life and the biblical stories. The staunch realism of the painting bothered people. And indeed, we'll see this, this happen with Artemisia as well. One last painting, just very quickly to demonstrate Caravaggio's style is his conversion of Paul. Again, you see the hallmarks of his style very apparent here. Uh, he increasingly uses artificial light sources in his paintings. Um, so we've got this really bright, almost like a spotlight here. He uses limited details. So again, you have that um, compressed space in the background. I mean, how is this horse even fitting in that space? Okay, so it creates a kind of tension. Is it going to fall out? Is it going to fall down? Um, even though there aren't a lot of details, um, it's highly naturalistic in the textures, the deep, uh, the, the horse hair, the, the skin of the, the men depicted, um, the fabrics that they wear. And so this is real attention to, um, to surface detail and surface texture, but there's not a lot going on in the panel. The deep blacks and the heightened um, light create a, an almost um, pronounced chiaroscuro, which um, has a new name, which is called tenebrism. 
okay, from the meaning dark and gloomy and mysterious. So now what happens with Caravaggio is the figures almost emerge out of the back in, into the viewer's space. The diagonals we'll see also again with Artemisia and the um, extreme foreshortening of the figures, all of the skill, all of these ideas very much impact on Artemisia. And it very much appealed to her needs. Remember, everything that an artist does is about the choices they make. Um, if, if it serves her need, that is the only reason she's going to take on Caravaggio's style. Um, we already see some of these um, ideas coming through in her, her works um, that I've showed you, particularly this Annunciation of 1630, which is almost um, as though it's on a stage set. It's very theatrical. Um, the luxurious textiles and colors and the shaft of light, almost like Bernini's um, coming through the clouds and the, the dove of the Holy Spirit shooting through, um, ready to um, give the grace to the Virgin Mary. Um, the very strong light um, and, and the emergent figures emerging out of the background, very much representative of Caravaggio's style, but in this case taken on board um, by Artemisia. She often uses more vibrant colors than, than Caravaggio. Um, you can see the same sort of uh, and stylistic um, ideas coming through in the self-portrait as a lute player. It's not as extreme, it's more chiaroscuro than it is tenebrism, but you still see that figure very much formed by the way light and shadow falls across her. The diagonal of the lute is beautifully placed, placed and interesting and it gives a bit of depth to the image, perhaps even too much depth in the space allotted to the figure. So even in, in some of her earliest images, like this Danai, you can see her embracing Caravaggio, even if tentatively. The story of Danai, perhaps semi-autobiographical, relates the Greek myth of a young woman confined to her bedchamber by her father, the king of Argos. An oracle had predicted that her son would cause the father's death. And Zeus, adamant to have this child created, transforms himself into a shower of gold and impregnates Danai. The bright light here rakes across in from the right, heightens the sensuality of the figure's flesh and also gives a narrative flourish to the coins that draw, uh, that sort of fall down from the sky. Um, see the black background, um, again, the compressed space, but used in a narrative way to highlight the shower of gold, which is meant to represent the presence of the king of gods, Zeus. The darkness and the light used for dramatic force um, forces the viewers again into the viewer's space. Um, compositionally and stylistically, Artemisia sticks to established conventions here, but you can see her learning process. So it's not the most perfect panel, it's not the most successful panel, but you can see her starting to engage with those contemporary artistic ideas. And so you see this all through her, her work where she takes little bits and pieces from um, different artists, from her father's workshop, from Caravaggio or, or others, but she makes them her own. So in this case, she's um, still very tentative, um, but if we look at some of her Judith images, her maturity as an artist can be more easily tracked. Um, it seems that in the subject of Judith, she found her passion, perhaps as some argue, um, her way of dealing with her rape, or um, again, as, as Fabio mentioned before, some, some scholars interpret these paintings as a way of getting her revenge on Tassi. We don't know what the case is, we, can, we can't assume. We can see in her various versions that Artemisia essentially invents a new figural type. Um, I mentioned this before, the strong female hero, which departs greatly from the male interpretation of the female, um, which is quite typical and traditional through the Renaissance and even before um, as youthful beauties or old hags, okay? So in the various paintings, Artemisia 
reverses the typical male-female relationship. And here, in most of her paintings, the female becomes the strong protagonist. The Judith story. Um, the story is an Old Testament um, story about a Jewish uh, woman, Judith, who saved her city from the siege of Holofernes, who was a general of the Assyrian army. Entering the enemy camp, Judith pretends to bring Holofernes information that will ensure his success. But he was struck by her beauty and invites her to dinner and makes plans to seduce her. He drinks too much wine at the banquet and becomes incoherently drunk. So she takes advantage of the situation, beheads him, and brings his head to his, to his fellow citizens. Uh, sorry, her fellow citizens, saving them from suppression. So this is a theme that she picks up an awful lot in her oeuvre. Um, two versions, um, early versions of the, the exact same composition are represented here. One in 1611 to 12, so this is literally just at the time of the rape and the trial. And then a later version um, in 1620 um, to 21, which was commissioned by the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosimo II de Medici. Cosimo never liked it, though. This is one of those, those images where the patron rejects, or almost tried to reject the, the painting. Um, it was too realistic um, for him. A Galileo Galilei, apparently, was the, um, the assistant who helped um, Artemisia um, get the payment for um, for the commission in the end. So hats off to um, Galileo. The composition is uh, quite interesting and uses many of those, we'll call them Caravagesque techniques that we were just talking about, particularly the diagonal, um, the raking light, and the tenebrism um, that we spoke about. Um, so we have Judith um, in both compositions and her maidservant, holding down the, the large um, and muscular figure of Holofernes, the general, and lopping off his head. The blood and, and the, the entire composition in the later version is much more successful. Um, and the blood, the way it um, bursts from his neck almost as she cuts through is much more naturalistic in the second one. Um, you can see the rivulets of blood dripping down the white sheets in both images, but again, and it seems much more satisfactory and, and rich in, in the later one. She includes things like this sort of the pressure that's being placed on the head of Holofernes as she grabs his hair um, and shoves down his head, opening up his neck for the, the cut. Um, you can see the tension in the wrist, the tension of holding the sword and forcing it through the flesh and, and bones. Um, so really, really um, violent um, and powerful image. You get a sense of that in the 1611 version, but it's not as, as, as virulent. Um, the fabrics are much more refined that she paints in the second version, possibly because of her actual skill, but she might have had the patron in mind in this one. Um, the, the lush yellow fabrics, the textures, the richness of them would appeal to um, the grand um, Florentine taste more generally. Uh, one thing I didn't mention here is the, the blood that spurts out and ends up on her dress and her breast, which is a new addition to the, the, the second um, work. Uh, so we have here some tentative steps towards the masterful final work on this theme. Um, Judith and the maidservant in both uh, images appear calm, yet quite determined, a kind of contrived drama within that sort of um, theatrical space that he creates. Yet all the figures are naturally rendered, as I mentioned, those textures, the textures of the skin and the blood, the proportions of the figures are all very natural. The way the blood um, comes uh, and, and sort of seeps down, uh, all of this is very naturalistically observed. Um, like Caravaggio, her images are not idealized. The figures 
um, are, are not at the epitome of beauty according to the standards of the time. Have in both, but especially in the second version, the raking light from the left, which highlights the story, the narrative, the arms, the sheets, the faces of the women. And note that um, Holofernes face is kind of decorously shadowed in both, um, but yet we can still see his, his features. So the tenebrism is, is very truly embraced here for dramatic effect. The dark compressed backdrop pushes the light hues toward the viewer. Um, the use of the di diagonal creates complexity and, and a sense of, of tension, again, drives us into the narrative. Holofernes' head and the sword are at the center stage. All the elements of the composition lead the viewer to look upon it. You've got the arms coming down, um, all leading to um, the head. Um, they're unflinching gazes. The sword itself, all of this driving our view into the center of the panel. The violent, oops, sorry, what, the violent um, sentiment is clear. The man's strength is made impotent by the sword, a kind of ironic twist on reality. And so this des possibly desired reversal of reality is the message. Is it autobiographical? We don't know. Um, it's a very literal rendering of the narrative, something she begins to refine. If we compare her Judith and Holofernes to one that Caravaggio did, um, we can see that she's actually much more successful. Um, Caravaggio's is, uh, all the figures are on the frontal plane. Um, it's staged, it's a bit stayed. Um, the projection of the scene um, on the diagonal in Artemisia's version um, very much um, increases the intensity of her work. The strength of the female protagonist is asserted in Artemisia's, where Caravaggio's Judith looks uncertain. She kind of recoils. Um, there's a lack of strength in um, her grabbing of his hair and the thrusting of the sword. Her old maid almost stands out emotion as opposed to um, Artemisia's maid, who is fully amongst the struggle. Another version of the story um, by Artemisia is in 1615, so not long after. Um, possibly the patron is Maria Maddalena, the Grand Duchess of uh, Tuscany. At any rate, she ends up with the, the painting. It's much more sophisticated in many ways from a narrative perspective um, than the previous one I showed you. She borrows, as you can see here in this small, um, image on the left, she borrows from her, fa her father's earlier composition on the same um, story. So she, again, she's very receptive to others, but she refines the composition. Here it depicts Judith and her maidservant um, after the event. So the deed has been done, the decapitated head is in the basket and the sword in hand. In this version, something stirs outside the tent. And so you can see the gazes, you know that, remember that external force that I mentioned in um, Baroque um, paintings, that, that tension is, is um, lifted um, because something happens outside of the panel. We don't know what it is. Um, she uses chiaroscuro um, here again to contrast between the foreground and the background and to create the illuminated features of the, the figures. Um, he also, uh, sorry, she also uses it to highlight some of these little beautiful excerpts from her style, the pommel of the sword, for instance, the gold um, on her bodice, the um, undergarment of, of lace, so uh, the decorated hair. So she's really putting on um, this style. The emotive tie to the viewer, which is also very much a part of that counter-reformation Baroque style, um, is enhanced um, by the composition. So we have um, almost facing us the back of the maidservant. So this enhances the involvement of the viewer in the story. The head of Holofernes is strategically positioned for us 
Um, notice how the basket tips somewhat towards the viewer so we can see what's in there. Um, his face is touched by light. The eyes are closed. Um, the, woman, the women's victory is very clear. And now finally, um, Artemisia's masterpiece in my view, um, the Judith and her maidservant of 1625. So it's interesting how many times she redid this scene. Um, in this one, she this is totally unique um, piece and it's, it really shows her creativity um, and that she's in full control here of her own palette and the tenebrism of, of Caravaggio. Um, the tenebrism, the dark light contrast heightens the drama. Um, Judith here is an unidealized hero again, a heavy set middle-aged character whose strength of will is conveyed both in her alert, determined face as in her body. The actual painting is monumental, it's over six feet tall. Um, the composition is very original. Rather than emphasizing the brutal death of Holofernes, Artemisia stresses the dramatic tension of the heroine's escape from the heart of the enemy camp. And this drama is amplified by the artificial light source, the candle, which casts heavy shadows across the picture plane. So this adds an element of mystery for the viewer. We can't see behind them, we can't see beside them, what's going on, so it's a very exciting image. Um, extending the drama to the unknown object outside the panel, very much a Baroque convention. The compressed space, again, it all takes place on the frontal plane. Uh, but unlike Caravaggio's uh, image uh, earlier with the conversion of Paul, this is almost possible. Right? His seemed very compressed and unrealistic. This, there's a, a tension in the size. It's a very confined space, but it, it's possible. So it's almost as though we've lifted up this curtain and we get a vision of everyday life, um, a scene revealed behind um, the curtain. Her technique is superb. The contrast of the bright colors, one set off against the other, um, with the light convincingly um, modeled across the fabrics is, is just extraordinary. In terms of the narrative depth and technical control, this image, refined after many versions, as, as I've mentioned, um, can be fully attributed to her artistic genius. Whatever her motivation, was it revenge? Was it therapy? Was it artistry? A combination of all three. Artemisia makes the last triumphant stand over Agostino Tassi in this image. And I'll just conclude this by going back to where we started. The self-portrait as the allegory of painting. Artemisia's life and works relay much about her experience as a woman artist in 17th century Italy. So rather than focusing on her trials and tribulations, which of course are very important, it is critical to consider her triumphs and successes on their own. She is objectively speaking, one of the finest artists in the Western tradition. We don't need to, to know her story to realize that. Her artwork truly testifies to her experiences for sure, but we mustn't taint our interpretation with misguided empathy. Life is hard and she worked hard to ensure her own survival and her legacy. Nowhere in the historical record does she present herself as a dupe or a victim. Always, always, she self-consciously regards herself as a fighter and a victor. This attitude is evident in the self-portrait as allegory of painting, um, which you can see here on the, on the slide, and also in this final quote, which I'll leave with you, where she compares herself to Julius Caesar. And she writes, you will find the spirit of Caesar in this soul of a woman. So why Caesar? Well, Caesar did not bow down in the face of adversity. Caesar was triumphant, successful, and strong. Comparing herself to him explicitly announces her unwavering militant spirit. Her gender makes her accomplishments all the more astonishing, but whether man or woman, her work is representative of one of the most prolific and artistically invented ages of Western art. For her creative intellect alone, we must pay attention to Artemisia.
Thank you. Goodness me. <laughs> Karen, you, you, you have kept us glued to the screen. <laughs> the years, it's uh, absolutely fantastic. The way you have positioned her in the society of the time, in the style of the time, the parallels you made with major painters of the time, such as Caravaggio, has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish everybody were able to give you a very good round of applause. It's, it's I just have a feeling. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, I can't see anything uh, when I'm talking. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I have the feeling that uh, in the various versions of Judith, she has put herself in that position, not in what she did, but maybe what she put, would have liked to do <laughs> towards Agostino. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe stretching things a bit too far. But mm. certainly she was an exceptional person for the time, an exceptional painter that in the, in the painting that you have seen, maybe her paintings were better than Caravaggio's in the ones they've shown, apart from some Matthews. Mm. Uh, and the, uh, um, I have two favorite paintings and that's my own expression. One is this surf portrait and mm. the other one is the first of the paintings of Susanna and the elders, where you see these two men whispering to, in the, in, mm. to each other, God knows what they're saying, you can easily guess what they're saying. Mm. And the detail of the white shirt, of the man to the left, just that gives depth to that formation of two men, which is absolutely incredible. Mm. Now, dear, look, look, Look at this, look at that. It, it would have been, the painting would have been flat there um, unless you could see that. Mm. It, I, I think it's astounding, the details, the quality, the technical, the inspiration, the colors are so fantastic. Mm. I'm sure that there are a lot of people that would like to ask you questions. So I open the, the place to uh, who wants to, Put some, ask some comments or put some questions to Karen. Is anybody there? I've got some chats there from uh, uh, people who are actually been. Thank you. Everybody is very happy with it, but too shy to ask you something. <laughs> Thank you. For your presentation. So, I, I have just a, a question um, as about your professional point of view. No? We, you, you brilliantly expose us uh, the painting of Artemisia and what a great painter she was, a great artist she was. Uh, and my question is going to be very silly, actually, because probably we all know the answer. But why, why we know Artemisia just recently, and she was not so famous in the past, and why we have so many uh, women or female painters um, in our um, art history? Mm. Yeah. Well, I think. Um... It's, it's, such an, it's such a big question, Antonella. Um, and I think Fabio sort of hinted at it at the beginning was the fact that, um, well, first of all, it wasn't possible for people to have impact. And I think that's the big thing. So women having impact, whatever they might have done, um, it was always um, set aside, set back. And the very fact that most of her paintings until recently were attributed to her father, um, as though you know it was impossible for for a woman to accomplish this. It just wasn't even considered um, a possibility for a woman. And so, and so, not only are there so few women, but those that do make um, make tracks, 
many of them are actually, you know, good in their time. Like Lavinia Fontana, sorry if I upset anybody, she doesn't do anything for me. I don't find her to be um, a, an exceptional artist. Um, and, you know, maybe she just wasn't. And that's fine. She doesn't need to be. There are many non-exceptional artists in, in the world then and now and any other time. Yeah. But Artemisia actually stands apart. Like, you know, whether we know her name or we don't know her name, even in that time before the, the middle of the 20th century, when her works were attributed to her father, they were still brought out. They were still exemplary of the situation. And so, and of the style. And so that in itself is a testament. It doesn't matter, male or female, it's the artwork that is exemplary. Um, so I don't know if that actually answers your question because there are so many reasons why um, we have so few female artists, um, but we also have to look elsewhere for female artists. When, when you, you know, go back to the period that I study, um, there are, so many nuns who created beautiful works of art um, that nobody would consider important because they're, you know, religious dolls or vestments or, you know, small iconic paintings in, in insignificant perhaps spaces, but um, they didn't have the opportunities to, to present the works. They didn't have the opportunity to learn um, the, the skills. And so those who do make it through are exceptional only because they can do those things, but are they representative? That is the question. And should they be in, you know, included in the canon? That's, yeah, sorry, Fabio. Well, uh, come on, come on, come on. I'm sure you must have been so thoroughly impressed by Karen's presentation and the subject of her presentation. Okay. I'm sure that, no, you were not all that familiar with this painter and with this artist and with this incredible woman. Now you, you have it and uh, you have to go and extend your knowledge uh, of this painter by yourself because it's something that you should do because it's something so important, so fantastic, and so exceptional. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had, we have seen another presentation from Detroit, where the emphasis was in fact much more on the feminine, on the, on the woman that was uh, the victim of such abuse, rather than the, the art and the painter. This one uh, has put the accent where it was meant to be. Mm. Karen, you'll be marvelous. I don't know how to thank you. And I think that everybody shares the thoughts with me. And uh, uh, please put your hands together for a round of applause. Thank you. That was, um, it's such a great pleasure. It was, I really, really, really enjoyed this. <laughs> so uh, anytime, um, it's just, it was just a fabulous. Well, now we've got something else in store with you later in the year because Karen is preparing or is teaching uh, an interesting subject. And she will uh, later on in the year talk to us about pandemics and the plague from Rome times to more modern times, the effect on society and the cost to society. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, and meanwhile, so. thank you. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and you. we'll see Bye. you next time then. Thank you, Brava. Thank you, everybody. Ciao, ciao, Cristiano. Ciao, tutti. Bye, bye. Ciao.